Jesse and I are in Athens, Georgia today um, at the University of Georgia. We're at the Honey Bee Research Facility uh, for the University of Georgia. We're with Jennifer Berry and Lewis Bartlett and uh, just a casual interview. I don't have a list of questions in front of me. We're going to talk about my research, past and present and future, and uh, just to uh, let this interview go anywhere it will. First, Lewis, I want to ask you, you're not part of the entomology department. What's your official, um, what, what do we yeah. call you? What department are you in? Yeah, so I'm actually in the Department of um, Ecology, or rather the Odom School of Ecology here at University of Georgia. I have a fellowship at the Center for the Ecology of Infectious Diseases. So I'm trained more traditionally in part as a honeybee biologist, but also mostly as an infectious disease biologist and a parasitologist, which is where my interest in varroa control and how they interact with honeybee viruses comes from. And so I'm actually housed in our interdisciplinary center for understanding the ecology of infectious disease. And I've worked with the honeybee lab now since 2014, but I've never formally been a part of it. It's always just been this collaborative relationship throughout the different positions I've held over the last seven years now. Well, whenever I've been at uh, beekeeping conventions and watched you lecture and speak, I've been very impressed. We all here consider you a very smart person, so you have to live up to that today now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're here to talk about mites today, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah. I don't even know quite where to start. Let's start with, you're going to use 48 of my colonies in just a few weeks for a study to check on a new way of, of applying oxalic acid. Can you give well, us actually, a Well, actually, if we could, we, let's back up just a bit and kind of okay. give the whole history okay. on, on, on the lead up to that. And you jump in at any point. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, but I guess it was probably four years ago now, maybe three, four years ago, Randy Oliver had written an article in American Bee Journal, as he does every month. Yeah about this uh, using shop towels with oxalic acid, vegetable glycerin, and in, in making it an extended release because that's the problem. We have to have material in that hive that's going to be continuously effective, killing mites, and not just a bomb that goes off for 24 hours. So he read about this gentleman's um, experiments down in Argentina, mm -hmm. and um, what is his name? Oh, I can't recall. We'll, we'll, we'll think of it. Um, but anyway, he did this research on using the oxalic acid with vegetable glycerin, and he was getting really good results in decreasing, not just holding mites steady, but actually decreasing mm -hmm. mite loads within colonies. I contacted Randy and said, Randy, you... Oh, and then he said he started to do this experiment and was getting In good results. Northern California, where and, he's mm -hmm. based. And... He was seeing excellent results. So I contacted Randy by phone and said, would you mind if we could do some collaborative work? You're hot and dry in California. We're hot and humid in Georgia. And I'd like to see if it works here. Mm -hmm. So he said, yes, um, we got 200 colonies mm -hmm. you donated to, mm -hmm. for us to use. And then uh, Miriam, or, um, um, Michael Shearer. Uh, Trist. Uh, Shearer Turton, thank you, oh, from South Georgia, also donated 200 colonies. Mm -hmm. And then I, all of a sudden it was such a big project, I asked Dr. Jeff Williams at Auburn if he would jump in with his crew. And we all of a sudden now we had this great collaborative piece of mm -hmm. work. We tested the extended release shop towels. At multiple at, doses. Multiple doses, a 12 gram and an 18 gram. Mm -hmm. And one application and then two applications. Mm -hmm. Uh, across a two-year period using your colonies, and then we, then we came back the second year using our colonies, and we had absolutely no control. Did not help one bit. And you can do the statistical... Yeah, so that's all being fully analyzed now, and, and it's... Um, th there might be some evidence that it helps prevent mite growth, mm -hmm. but we could not get it to bring the trend in mite numbers down. It wasn't actively reducing mite loads, which, you know, if you're doing this all year round routinely, if you never let the mites grow, then it's going to look like control. If you're doing this as part of an IPM framework where you're waiting to reach this specific mite threshold to then bring in these chemical controls, 
that's not an adequate control for IPM if it's then not lowering them back below that threshold. Mm -hmm. Because then you're just perpetually at threshold and you're perpetually treating, which is not how integrative pest management works. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that is that typically here in Georgia, our mite loads, if they aren't acutely controlled, tend to get a lot higher than they are in a lot of the rest of the US. So for anyone who's not aware, I spent um, three years of my career actually based at UC Berkeley in Northern California, and I've done a lot of beekeeping in that region. You know, I've been out to the almond orchards, I've done sampling there, and it is very different coming from Britain, from Georgia, from California, you know, where you are located vastly changes the ecology of these parasites, and that's no surprise to me. And we shouldn't expect something that works in one region to necessarily work everywhere. Or work the same. Or work the same, indeed, especially when, you know, the chemistry of these things can be quite complicated, particularly with things like humidity. So, you know, we've done these big trials and we couldn't quite get it to, to work satisfactorily within these IPM frameworks that most of us agree are, are fairly important, which is a shame. Yeah, yes, because it would have been such a nice product, um, something very easy to, to make and to distribute. But another thing, too, like, like what Lewis was saying about California versus Georgia or Georgia versus Vermont or Missouri, we have such a, uh, an extended Varroa window. Our window for reproduction or Varroa reproduction is almost 12 months. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas if you go up to Vermont, it's greatly reduced or Northern California. So that's another thing you have to take in, in consideration with something works here in Georgia it may work probably everywhere <laughs> or not or not but right, yeah. we we to me i think this this the mm. southeast is really where it kind of what is it really puts stress um on these particular compounds if they're going to work or not in other words if you can make it here you might make it everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> there exactly exactly yeah. well you know that was one of the deciding factors for me to stop going to south georgia for the winter is we had no broodless period mm -hmm. we had no opportunity in the winter to treat when the bees were broodless mm -hmm. i have better bees simply and this can sound odd but my bees are better because I don't go south for the winter. Mm -hmm. nice. Of course, I'm not in Michigan or Vermont, so you know, that's different. But from North Georgia to South Georgia, it gives us that three, maybe a four-week window. And we nailed the mites last winter with oxalic acid vaporization or sublimation, I guess, is the proper term. Actually, vaporization, I think, is where, where it's tending to lean. And, is that right? Yeah, yeah and that was just some work that Cameron Jack did down in the uh, University of Florida. Um, anyways, one of his papers, he was explaining that, and I actually want to have a conversation and get a little more in-depth about, okay, yeah. about using that word. Yeah. He's done some good work down there. Mm -hmm. He yeah. has. And, and and we'll, um, but anyway, so we did the extended release, and... <clears throat> did not find um, good results. No. So then we decided to basically do what beekeepers are doing, mm -hmm. where we would treat with uh, vaporized oxalic acid multiple times, five days apart, and we, we took it as far as seven applications, mm -hmm. five days apart, and again, we had a very static um, result as opposed to a cidal. So like, yeah. So the untreated colonies, mite numbers continued to grow, which one would expect throughout the summer, and the treated colonies just held flat. It was almost exactly mm -hmm. the same result. We were getting adequate control to prevent increased mite growth, mm -hmm. but again, it, the presence of a large brood area just prevented the oxalic being effective enough to actually drive those mite numbers down. Let's repeat that again because okay. that's important well you and the treating, problem with that okay go ahead you're treating five days apart five days apart seven times in a row mm -hmm. seven applications and the population my population just stayed did not decrease did not yeah now the problem mm -hmm. with that some be i mean yeah okay we're getting some kind of control but as a beekeeper I need something that's going to bring those mite numbers down below the economic threshold mm-hmm if we don't get those mites down below, and they're because say okay, say we start off at ten percent infestation rate, and we hold ten percent infestation rate, those colonies are toast mm -hmm. coming into winter. Now, if I if I'm treating at a one percent infestation rate and I hold it at one percent, 
Okay. They're perfect. Then we're okay. But you know as much, every colony is different. And as we're doing alcohol mm -hmm. washes and sticky screens, colony to co every colony has a different mite load. And so if you're just blanketly treating with multiple applications, thinking that you're getting equal representation, mm -hmm. equal control, you're not. Because mm -hmm. every colony has its own mite load. Um, and so I think what we will say, or what, what we have said with this paper, and, and Lewis is on this paper, he did, um, he did all the analysis for it, and this paper is in review right now, mm -hmm. is it's not, I, mean, I don't want to say it's not working, but it's not appropriate control in an IPM. Precisely. Um, uh, uh, the, Framework. That, thank you. So that now, was, you and I <laughs> spoke about this. You asked me a lot of questions about what I thought about uh, the uh, interval between treatments. And uh, I, I'm actually going by something he said when I met him a few years back. He was at a, a list. I, I asked you a question that nobody to that day had ever answered for mm -hmm. me. I've asked a lot of people this question. How long before a mite hatches before it enters another cell? Mm -hmm. And you ventured an answer saying between four and fourteen days. Well, that's a pretty big spread. And you, is, you may yeah. have changed your mind since then. I don't know, but to that point, nobody would answer that question for me. So if a mite begins to enter another cell within four days, mm -hmm. and you wait five or seven days, you've lost. There's a big window there. Yeah, but it's constant. See, and that's the thing. They're not. They're not. I emerge in four days. I go in. It depends on their nutrition. It depends on temperature. It depends on on brood availability. It depends mm -hmm. on population. It, so there are so many different factors that variables. are going on variables mm -hmm. that you know we can't we can't say okay exactly every four days those mites are going to be entering going back into the cells again. Well, uh, let me ask you this: Do any mites enter a cell earlier than four days? Yeah. I almost guarantee that some do. I don't know what the proportion is. I, if I remember my thinking when you asked me that, because I do recall, I, that was a back calculation from studies that have looked at the maximum reproduction of a single female mite. And if you, if you know their lifespan and you know how many daughters they typically have and how long it takes them to breed one daughter, you can kind of back engineer that, right? Mm -hmm. if, if they need to reproduce you know, 20 times in 10 weeks, then you know that the, the cycle has to be about three and a half days. Now, that's obviously not the real numbers for varroa mites, but I, if I remember correctly, that's how I, I back calculated from other pieces of information what it has to be. And, you know, sometimes you can do that kind of mathematical deduction. There's only certain certain ways that numbers can work out and if we know how long mites live and we know how long it takes them to reproduce and how many reproductive events they do then you can kind of figure out how long they're spending not reproducing just for etic on the bees um, and at, at any given point you know all the studies that we've done show that about 60% of mites are under capped brood mm -hmm. you've only ever got about 30% of the mites at most. Theoretic, at most, in the colony. And if you're treating during the daytime, a subset of those are off on the foragers who aren't even there. So you're really only hitting, on any given day, about 20% of the mites that are there. Yeah, um, and that's the problem with mite. I mean, that's why mites are so difficult to control. Mm -hmm. They yeah. really are. They, they're, they're, they're a challenge. And when I speak to other scientists who work in pest control, they don't envy us for trying to kill a bug on a bug. Okay. That is a, that's a challenge. And in fact, I was just writing... Um, a contribution to a book chapter on parasitology at the moment and a big focus of that is movement of parasites within their host that A causes damage but B evades immune control or whatever an animal's doing, grooming, anything like that to police those parasites and I couldn't help but think about all the nefarious ways Varroa do that inside the colony as well, you know, if we treat the colony as the host uh, these movement patterns allow them to, to evade a lot of what we do which is why that is the one weakness of oxalic acid is that it can't penetrate those wax cappings. Now, just for uh, just for the viewers, what is IPM? Framework? So that stands for Integrative Pest Management. Um, it's widely applied across all of agriculture to reduce the amount of, especially synthetic but mostly chemical pesticides on crops and on livestock. Partly to protect farm workers, partly to reduce human consumption exposure to these pesticides and also to slow down the evolution of resistance in these pests 
to those chemical control agents. That was another big part of my training was I worked very extensively on my PhD in the evolution of resistance to control agents in pest species. Now, that wasn't on Varroa mites. That was on a, um, a caterpillar, a Lepidopteran pest. But the same principles generalize. The idea being with IPM that if you minimize your um, use of chemical pesticides, then you slow down how fast evolution uh, acts, how fast those pests adapt to overcome that, that pesticide. In the same way that we only take antibiotics when we need because we don't want our bacterial pathogens, things like MRSA, um, evolving resistance to those last lines of defense. There's a few other parts of that. There's this idea that if you rotate which control agents you're using, it's hard to evolve resistance to multiple things at once. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we suggest using both oxalic and something like amitraz in the same year um, to because if one set of aromites is immune to amateurs, they're probably going to get killed by the oxalic and vice versa. Now, one big part of the IPM framework is deciding when to use those chemical control agents. And they're supposed to be the last line of defense after cultural or biological techniques, um, things like brood breaks and, and making sure they have a broodless period over winter um, and monitoring your pest levels to only treat when you need to so rather than being preventative being curative which kind of goes against the old idiom but in IPM that's this this core idea that you only apply these chemical agents when there is enough pest to justify it in the same way that we typically only take strong medications when we have to. You're only taking serious drugs to treat infections or diseases when you have to, because otherwise there's some, there's some cost to using them, there's some danger. And right. so that's where this thresholding comes in, where you but have to monitor. Mm -hmm. so, you're ta so I remember when, when I first started here at UGA at the B-Lab, that's what we would say, only treat colonies <coughs> that have reached the economic threshold, period. Which is so different for each person. For each beekeeper. It, right, but it's also different. I now say don't treat the whole apiary as a superorganism now because of the, the results from Brett's work, our PhD student, mm. how quickly mites move mm -hmm. from colony to colony, from apiary to apiary. And because of that, um, I have actually kind of shifted. I still am very much in, in, mm -hmm. in belief of IPM that we should be rotating. We should try different you know, mechanical or cultural methods, biological methods. Um, before we result strictly on just uh, chemical, but treat the apiary as the colony. There's some great work that came out of Germany where they were looking at, they were putting colonies in areas where they knew there were no other colonies. Now there may have been some feral colonies. They put colonies in, an, and basically it was an old military area. Mm -hmm. So they knew there were no other mm -hmm. beekeepers and no one else was allowed in these areas. And they monitored how quickly mites came in. And it was scary how quick my, my migration came into these colonies that were mite free. Um, and so that's when I really started kind of shifting my thought process as far as me being a beekeeper, not necessarily as the researcher, but as the beekeeper, that knowing how, how quickly mites can move and, and then how, how, different, how different each colony is. And also too, and I'm noticing that with some of the data that we're collecting, we may not have an, a really good representation of those mite numbers when we do an alcohol wash or when we do a sticky screen. Mm -hmm. We may only be capturing, you know, one day we might be capturing the real picture inside of that colony, but the next day, because it's raining or it's be this or that or the other, it, we may not be capturing exactly those the mite same. numbers. Right. That's why I, I that's why I, as an extension, Apiculturalist, when I go out and speak to beekeepers, I say treat your colonies or treat your apiary as your superorganism, as a colony. Mm -hmm. And if one has hit the economic threshold, treat them all.